And greetings to you. Joe Rubenstein here, producer and host of the Gotham Variety Podcast. I want to welcome all of our listeners. We thank you very much for your support and for joining us today. Hoping you enjoy this review, the first in an ongoing series, along with our audio drama episodes, our monthly baseball podcast, Gotham Hardball, and our upcoming interview series, Gotham Talk, that'll debut in the next month or so. But today's topic is Richard Jewell, a new film produced and directed by Clint Eastwood, who at the age of 89 is an absolute inspiration, to me at least. Not only is he making films still, he's still making really good films, and at an unbelievable rate, practically one a year. And this one is a true story of injustice, uh, an injustice perpetrated by two very powerful entities, the FBI and the media, upon an innocent man, uh, now deceased, Richard Jewell, died in 2007 at the age of 44 of diabetes-related heart failure, a man who should have been and was briefly lauded as a hero for his role in the events surrounding the Centennial Olympic Park bombing at the 1996 Summer Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, Jewell discovered a backpack containing three pipe bombs, and he alerted the police and then helped evacuate the area before the bomb exploded, saving many from injury or death, but instead found himself demonized as a mass murderer based on zero evidence. And I'm going to say that a few times tonight uh, because I think uh, to really uh, get a sense of the sort of Kafka nightmare that this man experienced, I think it's important to remember that there was no evidence against him, none. It's a film that thematically uh, would do Alfred Hitchcock justice. Hitchcock, uh, in a number of films, presented uh, the wrong man, the man falsely accused, uh, sometimes comically, as in North by Northwest, uh, but sometimes dramatically. If you want to see probably his most complete uh, handling of this topic, I would recommend The Wrong Man, uh, starring Henry Fonda, uh, released in 1956, and like Richard Jewell, based on a true story about a jazz drummer here in New York, uh, whose life was just destroyed because of a passing, uh, unfortunate physical resemblance to an armed robber. Uh, unlike Jewel, that man was actually prosecuted. Uh, but Jewel's life was, was irreparably damaged by really an, an overzealous, incompetent, and willfully dishonest FBI and a local and national media that uh, printed false assumptions as facts without bothering to do even the most basic necessary legwork to back up their story. I mean, obviously the FBI was under intense pressure to solve this bombing and to do it quickly. But rather than solve the crime, the FBI invented a, a hero bomber criminal profile out of whole cloth. And despite evidence to the contrary, did their best to crucify a good, if somewhat eccentric man who, you know, and, and one of the crueler aspects of this story, and it's very well demonstrated in the film, it would be bad enough for the FBI to train their sights on the wrong man and pursue him this relentlessly. But this man, Richard Jewell, uh, you know, just so happened to revere law enforcement. I mean, he studied the Georgia Penal Code in his spare time, okay? The FBI used it. They, they settled on a tactic uh, to use Jewell's excessive respect for authority to their advantage and try to trick him into helping them destroy him. It has to be seen to be believed. Honestly, I watched a lot of this film in a quiet rage, and uh, Eastwood, one of our very best filmmakers, probably my favorite living filmmaker, along with Quentin Tarantino, he just continues to tell compelling stories about everyday Americans uh, with intelligence, empathy, and economy. I mean, compare any of Eastwood's recent films to the bloat that you find in the meandering, repetitive, three-and-a-half-hour slog of The Irishman, Scorsese's latest film, vastly overpraised, in my opinion. It was a chore for me to get through that film. I mean, Eastwood, he's made some lengthy films, but it's pretty rare that you'll find a scene in any of them that is unnecessary or, or even an unnecessary line. Richard Jewell is exceptionally well-acted. Um, Sam Rockwell and Kathy Bates in particular... Um, the only exception I would say is Olivia Wilde, who plays reporter Kathy Scruggs. Uh, she seemed to me 
a bit over the top at times, but Rockwell is the best, just superb. He plays Jules' lawyer, Watson Bryant, uh, and he provides some of the more, um, some very welcome moments of humor in the film. Uh, he he gets frequently gets exasperated with the overly talkative and cooperative Jewel, who is also very well played, by the way, uh, by an actor I'd never heard of, uh, Paul Walter Hauser. Uh, it's a very uh, disciplined performance by Hauser that never strikes a false note. And the film is very well written as well by Billy Ray, uh, who wrote another worthwhile film about journalistic malfeasance called Shattered Glass, uh, about a reporter for the New Republic who fabricated a number of stories before he was finally caught. Uh, The screenplay for Richard Jewell is based on a very lengthy Vanity Fair article called American Nightmare, The Ballad of Richard Jewell, which uh, by Marie Brenner, published in 1997, which I've read and which I'll, uh, I'll point out some of the things from that article that did not make it into the film so that if you have seen it, you know, you may learn some more. And the other source for the screenplay is the 2019 book, The Suspect by Kent Alexander. Uh, the film does not cover Jules' whole life, but it gives you the necessary background to set the stage uh, for the whole bombing and the aftermath. Uh, in the opening scene, he's employed as an office worker at a law firm uh, where his eventual lawyer, Watson Bryant, works. And it's a very good scene because it efficiently establishes uh, Jules' personality, his, his diligence, his talent for observation, and his borderline excessive and almost creepy eagerness to please as he observes uh, what kind of candy Bryant likes and then keeps him well-stocked with Snickers. And, uh, and Jules moves on to a job after that uh, working campus security at Piedmont College, a Georgia liberal arts school, where he uh, locks horns with the president of that college, Ray Cleary, who reprimands him for being uh, sort of heavy-handed and overzealous. Jewel, uh, who did have law enforcement experience and graduated near the top of his class at the Northeast Georgia Police Academy, he was a bit overzealous, uh, writing out reports for minor infractions, drinking in the dorms, and so on. And Cleary ultimately fired him, uh, which wouldn't have been that big a deal, except Cleary, after seeing Jewel um, lauded initially as a hero after the bombing, took it upon himself to contact the FBI and present his evidenceless suspicions that Jewel may have planted the bomb and quote-unquote discovered it to make himself a hero. That was a false tip that the FBI took at face value. And of course, the media, as represented in the film by Kathy Scruggs, reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which at the time was seeing its circulation dip, presented a story by Scruggs and Ron Martz, uh, which contained this damning line as fact, quote, Richard Jewell fits the profile of the lone bomber, unquote. Utterly false, which I'll explain in a second. And another story published by that paper had this headline, Bomb Suspect Had Sought Limelight Press Interviews, and contained this line, quote, Jewell has approached newspapers, including the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, seeking publicity for his actions, unquote. Also false. He had not contacted the paper. And so with these articles came the grand debut of the specious uh, hero bomber theory. Again, not a shred of evidence, guys. Nothing. Now, as far as the hero bomber theory, there had been an incident in 1984 during the Olympics in Los Angeles where a fake bomb was found on a bus planted by a policeman, it turned out, uh, who did want to be a hero. He, he was caught. But what I learned from the Vanity Fair article, this idea that, that the hero bomber was an established criminal profile was totally false. It was totally dismissed by expert Robert Ressler, who spent decades in the behavioral science unit of the FBI and wrote a book called The Crime Classification Manual, uh, Ressler said that there was absolutely no such classification as the hero bomber, that no bomber he'd ever encountered fit Jules' profile of the, of the um, security guard who lived with his mother. Um, Ressler also said that the L.A. fake bomb was the only so-called hero bomber he'd ever heard of. And uh, one instance does not make a profile. And that bomb, it should be noted, did not go off, whereas the Atlanta uh, bomb did. And of course, Jewel himself could easily have been killed. He was knocked off his feet. And it would have been very difficult for someone to reap the rewards of hero worship when they were dead. So the FBI were basically acting like hounds on a blood trail, except it was fake blood. 
But Tom Brokaw, arguably the most trusted figure in TV news at that time, um, Brokaw, while noting that there were still holes in the case, said on national television that there was probably enough not only to arrest, but to prosecute Jewell. Uh, But, quote, you always want to have enough to convict him as well. Again, prosecute? I don't understand. Without a single shred of evidence and zero corroboration, how do you prosecute on that basis? I mean, where, where were the grown-ups in the room at these various media outlets? And Brokaw's carelessness reportedly cost NBC more than a half million dollars to settle Jules' lawsuit. And another piece of media malfeasance, which is referenced in the film, but is not covered as thoroughly as in the article, uh, Jewel kept a piece of blown-up fence from the bombing as a souvenir, which if you forget all the noise that followed and remember that he was actually a hero who had gone through a very traumatic experience in which he could have died and and which seriously injured several of his friends, I mean, to me, keeping a small piece of the fencing to commemorate the event doesn't seem really all that remarkable. And even if it did, it's not evidence of anything. Uh, But, you know, now this part was not covered in the film. Jules' lawyer, Watson Bryant, uh, confirmed to a reporter, quote, Yes, Richard had a souvenir of the bombing, unquote, namely the fencing. Here's the problem. The reporter cut off the ING at the end of bombing, so it read, Richard had souvenirs of the bomb, completely changing the meaning of that quote. Now, this was sort of corrected a day later, but it was too late. I mean, the original had been picked up, and uh, Bill Press repeated the false story on CNN's Crossfire, saying, quote, and, and this is like... It's like that game of telephone where a statement is whispered from one person to the next and gets sort of subtly changed until it bears no resemblance whatsoever to the original statement. This is what Bill Press said on national television, quote, the guy was seen with a homemade bomb at his home a few days before, unquote, absolute falsehood. He was seen with a piece of fencing a few days after by the FBI. So, so much for any kind of journalistic standards. And it wasn't just CNN. The New York Post smeared Jewel as, as a village Rambo and a fat, failed former sheriff's deputy. They were later sued and settled. Um, Jay Leno, who, if he ever said a funny thing in his entire career, I must have missed it. Um, he called Jewel the Una doofus and asked, what is it about the Olympic Games that brings out the big, fat, stupid guys, for which he was also sued and settled? And by the way, these lawsuits I've mentioned, they, they weren't a money grab by Jewel. Uh, they, they were more an attempt to clear his name. And the vast majority of the money in these settlements went to lawyers or taxes. And I'll give you some information on Jewel's later life, a closer look at the FBI's malfeasance in this case, and some conclusions about the media's telling reaction to this film right after this. Your feedback is important to us. On Twitter, at Gotham Variety, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash gothamvariety and subscribe. So as poorly as the media comes off in this film, the FBI comes off worse. With no evidence, they initiated surveillance of Jewel. They had a friend of Jewel's wear a wire and record a conversation. They asked Jewel to repeat the bomber's message. There is a bomb in Centennial Park. You have 30 minutes. They asked him to repeat that 12 times into a tape recorder, raising the possibility of phony evidence. Thankfully, Jewel's lawyer put a stop to that nonsense. And on the heels of their their stupid hero bomber theory, they concocted a second false theory, something about Jewel being actually gay and that his gay lover was his accomplice, which, by the way, on top of the fact that Jewel was not gay, that that theory totally contradicts the hero bomber theory. Why would an accomplice risk execution to enable someone else to be a, a fake hero? True love, I guess, that was their thinking. Makes no sense. Um, But the FBI also, they brought Jewel in for an interview without legal counsel on the pretext, the lie, that he would be narrating an FBI training video. And by the way, uh, John Hamm, uh, formerly of Mad Men, 
Uh, he, he seems to specialize in playing these sort of arrogant, uh, self-righteous jerks. He's actually very good at it, and he's very good in the film. But Ham represents the FBI as Agent Shaw, and, and Agent Shaw is a fictional composite of two actual agents, Johnson and Rosario, and perhaps a few others. But it was Agent Don Johnson who had a history of overreach, and it was Agent uh, Don Johnson who perpetrated this training video lie, telling Jewel uh, to pretend for the camera to fill out a waiver of rights form. It's actually, that's actually one of the best scenes in the entire film. It's very tense. It's sort of, watching that scene, it's sort of like watching a live mouse get dropped into a tank with a boa constrictor and only gradually realizing that it's in mortal peril. Um, it's a remarkable uh, bit of acting in there by Hauser. As you watch him, uh, you see a lot of it in his eyes as he comes to the realization that he is, in fact, the prime suspect. Uh, now, I want to address the media's reaction to this film, which has been uncommonly defensive, considering the fact that, first of all, this happened a quarter century ago, and very few of the guilty uh, media members are still players in the, on the scene today. And secondly, it was clearly botched. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And so you would think, you know, this would be a great opportunity for some, you know, healthy either self-criticism or at least analysis by the media of what went wrong. But instead, a great many in the media are trying to portray themselves, not Richard Jewell, as the victims, there's a lot of heavy weather being made about 60 seconds of this two-hour, 10-minute film. It's a scene that implies but doesn't show that reporter Kathy Scruggs exchanged uh, sex for information from the FBI. Uh, the screenwriter, Billy Ray, said that he stands by every word of his script. But unfortunately, um, the real Kathy Scruggs died of a drug overdose in 2001, so she can't give her side of it. Um, by the way, she was apparently uh, very remorseful about her role in this whole disaster, which is shown in the film by Eastwood. Uh, he shows her uh, bursting into tears uh, at a press conference. Or it's, really, it's really a press statement by um, Kathy Bates, who plays Jewel's mother. But, you know, if the exchange of sex for info did not happen, or if there was some doubt that it happened, then obviously... It shouldn't have been implied in the film, or they should have made the reporter a fictional composite as they did with the FBI guy. But honestly, I think that the media's hyperventilation over this 60 second scene, and even more, their kind of frenzied attempt to portray the film as some sort of love letter to Trump. Look, I have no idea if Clint Eastwood is a Trump supporter, and I really don't care. But I think, you know, these lines of attack by the press not only miss the mark, but frankly, they kind of do a disservice to the memory of Richard Jewell. And they also strike me as a kind of um, bait and switch to divert attention from the fact that the media completely screwed this up. But not just this, but many times since. We've had many examples of rush to judgment in the press. We saw it last year with the Jussie Smollett case, where not just the media, CNN, uh, NBC, and others, but a number of politicians, some currently running for president, were entirely credulous. He, I mean, he was the darling of the talk shows. Almost everyone in the media fell for that hoax, hook, line, and sinker, without questioning any of the inconsistencies in that story. Um, and then you've also, you've got the horrific uh, Jeffrey Epstein case, where the media, with one exception, uh, Julie Brown of the Miami Herald uh, did some great reporting on him for a long time. But the vast majority of the media either ignored or whitewashed one of the absolute worst serial pedophiles in American history for years until he was finally arrested. And since then, it's come to light that ABC and others squashed investigations into Epstein, who did not kill himself, in my opinion. I mean, we've all seen photos of who was on that plane with Epstein. There were some very powerful people. So the media has not exactly covered itself in glory in the past few years. They have far too often not bothered to use multiple sources or sometimes any, sor any reliable sources before confirming stories. And as I said with the Epstein case, we've seen them not report stories that uh, were problematic for them or stories that maybe clashed with their particular narrative. I mean, one recent example here in New York, hundreds, hundreds of Orthodox Jews in this city stabbed, punched, kicked, spit on for years now. And it's most of it's on video. A massive, unprecedented, really, 
uh, spike in anti-Semitic hate crimes that started three years ago. And, and, you know, when it was a white nationalist shooting up a synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, then the national media was all in. They, they covered that fully as they should have. But, you know, when the perpetrators here in New York are not white nationalists, but they're minorities themselves, the media takes a pass. I mean, with the exception of the New York Post, uh, the media has been basically MIA on this whole topic until finally it got so out of control in December uh, with attacks like every day that that forced their hand and they had to cover it. And e- even then, the coverage has been pretty dishonest at times. So no, the media, they, they've not been friends of the truth too much of the time. And, you know, as far as the film being some sort of love letter to Trump, I don't see it that way at all. What, what I see is the latest in a very long line of films going back decades that uh, take the media and the press to task, including the aforementioned um, Shattered Glass uh, network from 1976. That film takes a more humorous, kind of absurdist approach. There's a Billy Wilder film called Ace in the Hole that attacks uh, sensationalist media. Actually, Citizen Kane does that as well. But according to uh, much of the media, there's something kind of suspicious or downright nefarious going on with Richard Jewell. The Philadelphia Inquirer, for example, they headlined their review, quote, Richard Jewell is the movie America doesn't need right now. Okay. If you substitute the words the media for America in that headline, that would more accurately represent how they see this. Richard Jewell is, it's an honorable film that effectively dramatizes a true story that people do need to hear. And I think that the media's discomfort with it indicates that Eastwood hit a nerve. I would certainly recommend that you see it. It's doing badly at the box office. Um, Maybe some of the bad press or maybe the fact that the lead role is played by an unknown. I don't know. Actually, when I went to see the film here in New York, the theater was full. But, you know, in an era when most films are about nothing, uh, this one, the latest in a long line of such films by Clint Eastwood, who's a great director and an artist, is definitely about something. I think it's an important film, and I think it's highly relevant. Uh, One final note on Richard Jewell, the man. In the years after the bombing, he worked in various law enforcement jobs, including as a police officer in Pendergrass, Georgia. He was also a deputy sheriff, and thankfully, he lived just long enough to see himself fully exonerated. In April 2005, two years before Jewell died, Eric Rudolph pled guilty to carrying out the bombing at Olympic Park, as well as three other attacks across the United States. Rudolph is now locked up for life in the Supermax facility in Colorado. And one year before Jewel's death, Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue honored him uh, for his rescue efforts during the attack, calling him a hero and a model citizen. And on each anniversary of the bombing until his death, Richard Jewell would privately place a rose at the Olympic Park scene where spectator Alice Hawthorne was killed. As always, I welcome your feedback. So if you have any questions or comments on this review or any of our other episodes, please contact me via email, joe at gothamvariety.com. We'll see you next week with our sixth dramatic episode, The Sergeant's Private Madhouse, A Tale of War and Insanity. And don't forget to check us out and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. And while you're there, leave us a five-star review if you don't mind. Many people have done this for us already, and we really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you soon. Take care.